great. <laughs> thank you. Thank I'm you, thank here you. for you, Sam. I got you back. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, yeah, so thanks to everyone for joining for the last session of the day. Uh, my name is Samantha Martin. I'm a state policy associate with the Children's Defense Fund, um, and I'll be moderating our panel. Um, at the beginning of the program today, we heard from a number of political leaders who were absolutely essential to passing our new gun laws here in Michigan. Um, in this session, we're going to focus on the advocates and the activists behind the scenes who've helped build political power, shape public opinion, and mobilize the grassroots as a part of a campaign. Uh, here on the panel, we have many of the key members of the End Gun Violence Michigan Steering Committee who will all introduce themselves shortly. On their own, they're all powerful leaders for change, but I've been most impressed by their work when working together building a collaboration that has really changed the politics of gun violence in our state. We're also joined by Speaker uh, Lori Pahutsky, uh, who we heard from earlier. Uh, Speaker Pahutsky can help give her perspective on the relationship between outside activism and how the work shows up in the halls of power. So uh, before we get started and launch into these questions, I'd like to take just a moment for all of our panelists to go ahead and introduce themselves. My name is Bonnie Perry and I serve as the Bishop of the Episcopal Diocese of Michigan. That's about, I oversee about 75 communities of faith in South Central and Southeast Michigan and um, have a number of our faith communities directly affected by, by gun violence. And that is one of the many reasons I care. I'm Celeste Camperwalla. I use she, they pronouns. And I am the Michigan chapter lead of Moms Demand Action. And this is near and dear to my heart because my dad took his life with his firearm nearly 10 years ago now. And so I also participate, I'm, I'm actually a co-facilitator of a group in Washtenaw County where I live called Washtenaw Alive. And I also do this work because I have two boys, almost eight and 10. My name is Lori Bohutsky. Uh, I represent the 17th House District, which is a portion of Northeast Livonia, North Redford Township and Northwest Detroit in the Michigan House. And I serve as the speaker pro tem uh, in the house. I care because I am a survivor of gun violence and I also uh, was in school when things started shifting and unfortunately mass shootings became much more prevalent. So, you know, being there for the, the before times and the, the current environment that we're living in is uh, startling and disappointing and tragic and completely preventable. So that's part of why I care. Hi guys, um, I'm Maya. <laughs> um, I'm a student right now at Michigan State University and I'm in my last semester. Um, so hopefully I'll be graduating soon with my degree in psychology. Um, <clears throat> I started off with founding um, Sit Down MSU um, after the shooting at our university. And now I have the pleasure of working with these amazing people on this panel right now. Um, and gun violence, Michigan, as an intern, where I'm able to give them ideas, throw out my ideas, and they really help push these ideas together. And they're just such amazing people. Um, I do this because I'm from a community that has been struck by gun violence my entire life. Um, and as somebody who grew up, like I said, in the lockdown generation, um, it means a lot more to me. And it's more personal to me than I think um, most feel. So it's great to be here with you guys today. I hope you guys all got some good lunch in, so. <laughs> Hello, everybody. My name is Mia Reed, and I am the founder and CEO of the Charles W. Reed Community Health Center, which is in memory of my son, Charles Reed. I'm also the Detroit Group Lead for Moms Demand Action, and I care for several different reasons, but mostly because I don't want to see another parent have to struggle through grief and trauma as I have. So I am so glad to be here in this fight. Hi, I'm John Gold. Uh, I am an engagement consultant with Giffords. 
Uh, I'm here because I lost three people to firearm suicide in my life who were close to me. Uh, and I'm a survivor of gun violence myself. But mostly I'm here because the leading cause of death in children, zero to 19 in this country are bullets. Hi everyone, my name is Vicki Schroeder and um, I represent the Episcopal Diocese of Eastern and Western Michigan, so everything except the UP and Bonnie's area <laughs> on gun violence prevention and also interfaith action of um, Southwest Michigan. I got involved in this work because my background is healthcare and I saw it way too many times um, coming into ERs. And I raised a daughter in a lockdown and I raised a daughter under threats. So, um, so that's why I'm here. My name is Barry Randolph and I'm the priest and pastor of the Episcopal Church of the Messiah in Detroit. And I am here because I got tired of burying children because of gun violence. Thank you, everyone. Um, as you can see, we have some amazing panelists today, so I'm excited to get into these questions. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, the first question is, can you describe the evolution of your work as a coalition and what you did together to advocate for these new laws? I can go ahead and get us started, uh, mostly because my kids are going to be home any minute. and all hell is gonna break loose. So uh, let me just um, start by saying that I have been involved in this movement for almost eight years now. Um, and when I first started in the gun violence prevention movement, it was such a third rail issue. And I would get so frustrated turning on the news and seeing a blip about yet another mass shooting you know, no talk of the everyday gun violence that takes place in our country. And people would move on with their lives. And it seems that politicians weren't caring about it. And so fast forward to now, and now people are paying attention. And I really think that it is the youth who has brought the attention to our legislators because they wouldn't let them look away. And so I fight, I am so, so honored to fight alongside people like Maya, as well as everybody else here on this coalition. And I just, I love the fact that we are a coalition of so many different faiths, backgrounds, organizations, survivors, gun owners. We have people involved in our coalition who are all on the same page. And that page is just ending gun violence. We are not anti-gun, we are anti-gun violence. Barry, go for it. Yep, I'll go next. So um, like I said before, I'm Barry Randolph, pastor of Church of the Messiah in Detroit. And I just wanna say, I love this work and the evolution that has taken place because it is a true coalition of the work. There's so many people from so many different backgrounds being part of this. You have people from the faith base. You have people who are educators. You have people from medical, community-based, so many different backgrounds coming together for the same mission. And us coming together for the same mission, that's why we have so much traction. We work within the entities of which we specialize but bringing all of that energy together to say that we're all standing against gun violence is one of the greatest things that I think we can do. And I think that's why we have so much synergy and we have so much traction and why we're making so much of a difference. All of this pain is being turned into action and we do a good job of bringing everybody together from all different backgrounds to make this happen. Yeah, I kind of feel like we are um, citizens, right? Citizens who have leveraged democracy for change. Yes. It is no sitting, but saying, how do we act in the world with our values? Me as a person of faith, other people of goodwill, saying this is the society that we long for, and we're gonna turn our personal 
and corporate pain into change. And, yes. and this is the thing I want to say to folks is that even if it seems hopeless, coming together, finding that synergy, we can make legitimate, long lasting change, particularly when we're really clear about what our priorities are. And, yes. and for us, it was universal background checks, right? Extreme risk protection orders. If I'm at risk of hurting myself or someone else, I shouldn't have a gun in that time. Safe storage, keep the guns locked up so that our little ones don't just get into them and also protecting all of our folks who may have some connection to domestic violence. I think we just let go of what may separate us and came together to say, this is what matters. This is the pain we're gonna fix. On my last birthday, uh, it turns out Barry and I share a birthday. I was in church and, and a man gave a sermon and he said that we wade through the mess to get to what's valuable. And mm -hmm. I think if there's a definition of this coalition, that's really what we do. Uh, we all work together. We don't fight amongst ourselves. There are no petty potentates here trying to, you know, push their own agendas. Um, we have all decided that it's far more important to wade through the mess to get to what's valuable. And uh, that's what End Gun Violence Michigan means to me. John, I love that. Um, prior to coming together as End Gun Violence Michigan, how would you describe the gun violence work in Michigan? Did you all already know each other? Um, Celeste, if you'd like to get us started off. Sure, thanks. Yeah, I got a few minutes left before my kids come home. Um, so many of us did know each other. Uh, I knew, I would say the majority of people on this panel with me right now. And I've gotten to know the rest of them and I love all of them. And as I said, I'm so honored to be doing this work and fighting this good fight. And I just wanna say that any politicians who are voting against us are not only voting against the majority of Americans, but they're voting on the wrong side of history. I, th I think too, we, we, we might've been separate groups heading in the same direction. And I think the difference is that Ungun Violence Michigan gave us a focal point. Um, it really gave us a focal point to come together. Um, sometimes bureaucracy at, at different levels of organizations can get in the way of getting things done. And and Gun Violence Michigan is not a group that seems to allow bureaucracy to keep us from getting things done. Um, and that is refreshing and it's 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 from the roots. You know, it's from the roots of all of us growing into that tree to make something special. And it, it's it's really been a joy to do this work with everyone here. There are so many organizations in Michigan that have been doing this work. And many of us knew each other, know each other, love each other, but coming together with In Gun Violence Michigan, we got to bring our ideas together, bring our passion together. Because when we're all doing great work, but we're working in our own silos, we can't get a lot done. But when we came together as one, we had progress. Awesome, thank you. Um, Vicki, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to what you've been able to accomplish together that you feel you weren't able to accomplish otherwise. You're muted, Vicki. Muted. It's a Zoom call. I had to do it sometime today. So I guess that was my moment. Um, thanks. It's a great question. It, there's a few things that folks have touched on. One is that we had um, organizations from all over the state. 
and all different kinds of sectors. And when you start to put all these people together that represent different sectors, all of a sudden you've got physicians that show up and gun owners that show up and all different people, all different faiths, that when you need to influence leaders, legislators, you've got a story that relates to them that if you're alone out here in West Michigan, maybe you don't have that kind of um, leverage and ability to bring the right um, message to it. And I, I think that's been the power of this coalition is creating a very large tent, making sure that all kinds of sectors, not just advocates, but healthcare leaders and and social work and mental health and all these different kinds of groups that had a place and had a voice and could participate and engage with our work. And that, and we were clear about what we asked, like Bishop Bonnie said. Thanks, Vicki. Maya, I'd love to hear um, your response to this from the perspective of a student. Um, yeah, you know, um, we set our priorities uh, at the beginning of last, last year. I mean, these priorities have been here for years and years and years. But as a student at MSU, um, these had just become personal to me. Um, or I guess on a different level had become personal to me. And um, originally when I held the sit down protest, I knew we needed change, but I didn't know how or how, I guess, what was possible. Um, but I guess it all came back to the lesson of community, um, fulfilling our needs through passion and healing through the work that we did. Um, you know, these laws are essential in saving lives. And they are vital in making a difference. And I learned within this that we can't make change happen unless we have each other. And there's strength in being able to take care of your community um, because the only way we can accomplish this work is together. And um, I know this because we were able to actually implement life-saving laws. We, we are, you know, in dire need of a healing centered approach um, to this pain. And there is a lot of pain that comes with healing and it's definitely not the easiest road. Um, and it's one that I'm still learning the route to. So um, I know that together though, we're able to take care of each other and we're able to help each other because to do this work alone is extremely difficult. And it's more difficult, I think, to keep the motivation up. Um, actually, the other day, I, Pastor Barry was there. I heard someone say that um, we're not divided, but uh, we're disconnected. And to accomplish this, we need to understand that there are no barriers between us. And the only barriers that we have are the ones that we're putting in front of ourselves. Um, and I always say that there's really no right or wrong with change, um, because any effort is effort, period. Um, but I think it's important to not lose sight of why we started this change. I know I just started this in February. Of, it's not even been a year since all of this has happened. Some of you have been here for five, 10 years, you know, even longer, 15, 20, 30 years. And I'm still so brand new at all of this. I had to learn what like different parts of the government meant. And I was, I'm still a child. Like I'm still a baby. I still, you know, um, but we all in some way have been impacted by tragedy. And in these moments that feel so low, um, we cannot let our neighbors and us continuously fall because we need to lift each other up um, and we need to take charge to do that. And we can collectively with our collective pain, turn it into passion. Um, and we can turn that passion into, a, into power and that power it takes us to a position um, that will take us further than we can imagine really. Um, and that's the best thing about it all is that we did this work in Michigan together. I didn't know what I was doing, but you guys lifted me up, you know, you did it. And we accomplished this because I had you guys there to show me, you know, and I'm not 
you know, when you say that this falls in the hands of my generation, I am no expert in anything, but I'm an expert in preventing the reality that I faced. Um, so we accomplished so much because we're surrounded by people who care and by people who truly want change. And the best part about these laws is we'll never know if we saved a life or not. Um, oh, we have. To the outcome. We, we have. have. We have. But you yeah. know what, though? And we also know we're never alone. The one cool thing about gun violence, we're never alone. Bishop Bonnie had met me for all of five minutes, five <laughs> minutes. And I had lost a venue to, to do a book signing and, and, and do some crowdsourcing here in the city. And she'd known me for all of five minutes. And when she heard out I lost my venue, she said, no, you're going to come do it here. Right? It was instantaneous. We all back each other up. We all back each other's play. Yes. And, and I hope that's what Lori, I'm going to transition. I hope that's what Lori sees, is that there's this big bunch of people who all back each other's play walking in the Lansing. Thanks, John. <clears throat> that was the perfect setup for our next question. And I've got to say, Maya, you may be young and you may be new to the game, but with all the work you've been able to accomplish already, I am excited to see what you have, what your future holds. And um, yeah, yeah. Um, so Speaker Pro Tem Pahutsky, uh, you're not just an elected official, but you're also an important advocate. Your caucus has had an incredibly historic session this past year. I can only imagine how exhausted you are. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to <clears throat> what it's been like for you being on the inside of government um, during this really intense time. You know, it's it's been weird a little bit, uh, like living through and and being able to to help create history, right? I mean, we've done some really incredible and important things. And Throughout a lot of the last year, there have been times where I've left work after we've passed something, you know, really big that's, you know, frankly been stalled for 40 years or so. Uh, and I felt really, really good and, you know, like just over the moon. And I, I hope that everyone here understands what I mean when I say this. That's not necessarily how I felt when we passed the gun reform legislation, because while we waited that long to be able to get it done people died and for no reason because people valued a piece of property more than they valued people's lives and there there wasn't a whole lot of celebrating you know yes we're, we're people's lives are going to be saved in the future because of this but that doesn't negate the fact that people like maya and celeste and and our our clergy people and and john have had to come to the capitol and beg for elected leaders to do the bare minimum. And honestly, like the, the timing of everything was awful because when we, we, you know, had a, a gun, a common sense gun safety majority in the legislature, we had to go back and tinker with all of these laws or bills that we had introduced before, right? We knew that there had been litigation in the meantime, and we wanted to make sure that we were going to be able to pass something that wasn't just going to be thrown out in court, but in the process of trying to get it right, MSU happened and people were devastated and rightfully so, and people were mad and rightfully so. And we still had to go back and make sure that this was going to hold up in court. And that's a terrible feeling. And that's a terrible thing to have to have an honest, I'm very fortunate. I, I know the majority of the people on this call. So those were honest conversations that I was able to have, but that doesn't negate the pain that people feel in the moment when this has become such an inherently political discussion, that those are the conversations that are going on. So I, I certainly sleep better at night knowing that we, we got these things done and that there's more legislation coming. But this was one of the, the few days this year where we got something huge done. And I didn't just feel this huge sigh of relief because for countless families across our state, they never get that sigh of relief because it took us so long to do this. So it was a, a really weird mixture of emotions. 
Um, Representative, would you mind speaking a little bit to uh, your relationship and the Cox's relationship with outside advocates on this issue? Um, and from your perspective on the inside, what was the impact of the advocacy work? There is no way to overstate how important advocates are on this issue because they show up and they show up big and they show up, yes, to, to you know, cheer us on when we're actually like, you know, passing things, but also to hold us accountable on the days where, okay, wait, we haven't heard from you. Why we were supposed to have a committee hearing today. Why don't we have a committee hearing? And that's so incredibly important because yes, as John said, I never felt like I was going into any of this alone because I had all of my friends and my family in this space to, you know, bounce frustrations and, and give updates to, and to get feedback from, um, but there are some people that aren't that close with, with gun safety advocates. And sometimes those people need to be held accountable. I need to be held accountable too. I just don't have as much of a problem as some politicians seem to have with it. Um, but I mean, truly the, the fact that, you know, I mean, this is, and I don't expect Maya to, to remember this, but because you had enough going on in those days, but I remember going up to her the, the day that you all had the sit-in protest and apologizing that you had to come what the two days after just living through this massive trauma, still very much, you know, dealing with it. Um, and you all showed up to, to encourage your lawmakers to get off their butts and do something that should have been done for such a long time. And that's something that's really, really rare in this space. Like it, it cannot be overstated the importance of people, you know, who are primarily affected or most recently affected by uh, lack of action by the legislature showing up in those moments and and holding us accountable and telling us what they are demanding of us. It's it's really, really important. And that that co-governance relationship that we have where we can, you know, share drafts and and get support from other uh you know states that have already been through some stages of this process is huge and it's so immensely helpful particularly when we're trying to move as fast as we can but also making sure that we are uh you know dotting all of our i's and crossing all of our t's so it is such a a beneficial relationship and i'm so so grateful for the advocates in this space because they really do make me a better lawmaker and they create better legislation in the process Thank you, Representative. Um, I, I'd like to hear a little bit about, you know, this past year has had so many successes, um, but as you mentioned, the fight is not over um, and there's still a lot of room for growth. So um, I was hoping, Representative, could you touch on how you believe gun violence politics has changed? I think that, and we're seeing this in a, a lot of different spaces, but I think that People who support, uh, you know, common sense fixes to to gun legislation and and promote gun safety, are finally waking up and realizing that this is a wildly popular policy to support. Uh, you know, and they're, they're we're kind of getting out of our own way. Uh, we are taking people at their word when they say, you know, this this is something that does not. Uh, is it, not captured by any one political party or, you know, any one geographic region. That's not to say that there aren't, you know, uh, individual critiques or concerns from community to community. And that's important when we're actually working on the legislation. But this is overwhelmingly popular. Gun violence is something that touches every area of our state and frankly, our country. And I think here in Michigan, you know, we have finally start started kind of hitting our stride and and recognizing uh, the popularity of these policies and just standing firm in that and, and knowing that we're doing the right thing and we're doing the, the popular thing, for lack of a better word. And, and Vicki, could you speak to that from, from the perspective of an advocate? Thanks. Sure. And and for that, I, I have to say, go back to uh, prior to the election in 2022. So prior to the election 2022, many of us on this, on this group um, advocated and 
sought out meetings with legislative leaders to push for change around just one bill, like just one, safe storage. Um, because we saw the trend on youth gun violence and how could we change it. We did not as a coalition get discouraged, but we sure could have. Um, because there was no budging and there was nothing that was gonna come to the floor of the house. There was nothing that was gonna happen in the Senate and they made it quite clear that that's how it was gonna be. Except so, Please tell us the truth, Nikki. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they, I'm sorry. I'm, they, I'm, let, they told us that they would hold a hearing, hold a hearing, hold a hearing. We will, but when this, but we will when this, and we will when this, and 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 they did not. So here's what the here's what the politics changed. The politics that we knew was that polling information was telling us consistently that the support for what we were asking for was strong in Michigan and it didn't waver. Didn't waver before the election, it didn't waver after the election. And gun safety was the top of mind of voters. And, and part of that was we were thinking we were gonna start a ballot initiative, not necessarily, we didn't know how the election was gonna go. So post-election, um, it changed. We became um, a legislative advocate totally and worked with partners like Speaker, um, Speaker Pro Tem and started to work on um, what we could do differently. And so the politics changed because voters got out and voted. That's what made a difference. And then the second thing I would say is that um, different sectors that in our communities started to center around what it meant to talk about, about gun safety and have people think about gun safety as its own thing. We all have stories, we have multiple stories to share. And so as talking in communities and being able to um, share those stories, those very heartfelt stories started to change hearts and minds. And so for those of you in conservative areas, I'm one, um, those stories matter. Those stories really matter. And being able to touch hearts and minds about we all want our kids safe is a different kind of conversation than um, getting into some rhetoric about taking guns away or gun control or whatever else um, the talking point of the day is. And that's what's changed on politics. Thank you, Vicki. Um, so we've had this amazing successful year. We've, we've passed the legislation, but there's this whole other component of implementation, right? So I wanna open up the conversation to what do we need to focus on to implement these laws and make sure that they really move forward to save lives in our communities? Um, Pastor Barry, would you like to get us started on that? Yes. So one of the things we're going to be doing this year is community education. So we're literally going to be telling everybody about these laws, how these laws can be implemented. And we're going to look for people who can go out into the community to let everybody know these are ways that we can actually get this implemented. It is going to be up to us, a lot of boots on the ground people, um, to help make this happen. So it's going to take a lot of community education. And that's what we're going to be concentrating on this summer. I'm, we could use folks who are interested in really diving into this, like become the folks who make the difference. Yes. It's really a compelling thing. Um, I would like to jump in on you know education because 
I think we need to work with our schools um, yeah. and we need to learn how to use the necessary um, and proper tools. But I guess I guess we need to um, properly invest in our educators and in our youth, um, because like we always say, young people are our future and to properly nourish our communities, our schools and our children in term is to properly nourish our future and eventually nourishing ourselves because we hopefully won't have to stress about these things on a daily basis. Um, but, you know, these laws are great, but they're not going to work unless we are effective in how we educate. Um, uh -huh. So I think education is a really big, pi big priority here because, um, you know, uh, and it goes for us because we have to take the right actions as leaders in our communities. Um, and it's not going to be easy, but with the proper tools and the help from our community leaders, um, this is something that's incredible and it's very possible. Um, and it is our job to educate and nurture the little humans who don't even know their species <laughs> yet. Um, but, you know, it's, for example, if I were to drag a thousand pounds alone, I probably would get stronger. Mm -hmm. However, I would not be able to drag it at all. Um, but with 10,000 people dragging that 10,000, uh, 1,000 pound block, you know, it'd be as light as a feather. So um, it's for us to work together. And that means with our politicians, with our hospitals, with our schools, our law enforcement, whoever that might be to direct us in the position of change. Um, I think that's where we have to fall, um, fall to, to make sure that we educate ourselves, our communities, but most importantly, the people that brought us here in the first place, our teachers, um, because they're, you know, they are more aware of their actions and how they impact students. It takes one person in a student's life um, to build resilience. So resilience is really what we need, but to do that, we need education, so. Absolutely. John, I was wondering if you could um, speak to that as well. Maya did such a great job. Um, I, I do think though that we, we need to talk about law enforcement a little more because they're the ones who are either going to enforce these laws or not. And they're the ones who are gonna take a lot of risk while executing these laws. Um, and we need to invest in education and training, not take it away from them. We, we need to invest in people and that sometimes doesn't fit a format that in a community is seen as constructive, but the only way to make that a constructive experience is for them to have that training and education so that they can do the job properly. And if we ignore that, we create another problem. So I, I really believe that we need to invest um, in making sure that the community and law enforcement can interface to make sure that these laws get used correctly. Thanks, John. Um... I just want to point out that we keep hearing this message of being stronger together and the power in numbers. And so I just want to take this moment to um, draw your attention to the link in the chat if you are interested in getting more involved and becoming an advocate for these issues. Um, check out that link and uh, we look forward to working with you soon. Um, before opening up for Q&A, we've got some awesome questions from our participants. I just wanted to check in with uh, the panelists and see if there's anything else you'd like to add before opening up for Q&A. I did wanna kind of give a overview and touch on an area that we haven't. So we've heard from so many awesome speakers and all with, a common passion, which is the end gun violence, right? But I also recognize that there may be some of you out there that may be feeling lost, like I did when my son was taken by gun violence. 
um, maybe feeling devastated, maybe feeling hopeless, maybe feeling where do I fit in and what can I do? And at first, when my son was murdered, I didn't think anyone would understand how I felt, you know, um, spending hours on the edge of the bed, holding my child's picture, mm. not knowing how am I supposed to be a mom to my other children when I had nothing in me to give. And I felt as a black woman whose black son was murdered is he now just a statistic? Yeah. Because Blacks are disproportionately impacted by gun violence. And how does that reflect on me? But once I joined the movement with other organizations that are in the community doing the work, such as in Gun Violence Michigan, and hearing stories from other mothers, fathers, from sisters, brothers, from students, and hearing something similar, hearing somebody say some of the same things that I felt. Am I ever gonna be happy again? Wow. How am I supposed to go on? What are people going to think of me as a mother because I couldn't protect my son? What about my other children? Do I make them stay in a house now because it could happen to them, right? I felt heard. I felt heard. I felt seen. And I know it's so many people that feel okay, we're, we're out here and we're sharing our stories and we're marching, but nothing is changing. Yes, something yes. has yes. changed. Yes. We finally, we finally have laws to hold people accountable. Yes. We finally have a start because we don't stop there. We yes. do not, but we do have a start. And guess what, guys? I get it. I get it. And if I get it, and the people I'm listening to get it, you are here today for a reason. Yes. So you get it too. Yes. Join us yes. and let's come together. As you have heard from everybody, we came together as a coalition and we got something done. Imagine, just imagine if all of you join us and come together, what we can get done. Thank you so much for being here. And Mia, I just have to say, cause that was so powerful um, that many hands do make light work. You, you don't have to do all the work yourself. When we started out, it was almost like, how do we stop the murder? You got boots on the ground, people who will do that. But you also have people who will work with legislation. You have people who work in the medical and educators and all of these people coming together. It let us know we can make a difference. We may be separated in our different silos, but when we come together for one mission, one voice, one call, we can make this happen. And that's what In Gun Violence Michigan did. And within just two years, Two years, when you look at what we've done from the time we first formed, it is truly amazing work of people dedicated to make this happen. So um, yeah, I totally and, agree. It's amazing. And voting matters. Yes. Voting matters. Yes. We can do all the advocacy in the world and voting yes. matters. Yes. I, I would like to add really quick that you guys are such a beautiful group of people. Including um, you too. I'm giving you guys all the kisses, but um, it's it's so, I uh, really is an amazing to, you know, I'm a 20, 21 year old, like people my age, they're going out to the bars, they're getting drunk. I'm just 
being an activist, I guess. <laughs> but um, it's hard to connect with people my age um, because I don't think a lot of them care about much of anything but their achievements and their status. And it, it's really hard to go to school with people <laughs> that are in the position of an education when, you know, as somebody who I'm one in 10 students in poverty that get to go to school and I'll be one in 10 who graduate with a degree. So one in a thousand students in poverty get to go and get a degree in education. And I'm sitting at a university with hundreds and hundreds and thousands of students who do not understand the importance of how you know, one person may impact a life or one teacher may change your life and your outlook and your goals and your success. And how one politician may, may you know, help you find hope and make you believe that they're there for us, not for their position. And it's for those of you that are watching this, I hope you understand that sitting behind a screen is a great thing right now because you're one of 90 people who decided that they wanted to come and be a part of change today. Whether that means that you're just listening to us speak, you're giving us a space. You're giving us a space to feel and to express. And, you know, the gun violence community does not just help our outer communities and every community surrounding us. It offers us our own community. And I never knew any of you guys before this. And I know all of you now. And I can sincerely say that I love all of you. And it is such a beautiful thing to be surrounded by people who truly care about gun violence because it's not easy. It's not easy to look back every day and think about what tragedy brought you to the position you're in and what tragedy brought you to the place that we're here today at, you know? So I just want all of you to know that I love you and that no matter how old you are um, and how young I am, we are all still doing the work together. We're all in the same line, you know? It's not, it's not a wherever, you know? I've moved my hands all over, but we're together, you know? Um, and I hope you, you guys don't lose that motivation because I need someone to keep me going. And I don't wanna get to your spot and say, oh, I hope that you can change the future to the next 21 year old, because that's what I'm hoping to do right now, so. Well, and Maya, I just, I just want to say, Maya, that yes, you inspire me, and and yes, um, unfortunately, your generation is dealing with this. But I just want you and others who are working on this and and who have to live through everyday gun violence to know that us here and everybody who's attending today and so many others across the nation and even across the world, we're working on this together for you, for, for everyone. But, you know, I, I don't like it when people say, this is on your hands to deal with. No, we all have a hand in this. We can all help in this matter. So we are standing and fighting right alongside you, my friend, and I love you right back. Yeah. Everybody's trauma matters. You know, everybody's experience matters. Um, it doesn't matter, Maya, if you're 20 or if you're 50 or if you're 80. But I will tell you, I was thinking about you the other day because when I got shot, the first thing I remember telling somebody afterwards was it was the first time I felt old. Like it had taken something away from me. And, and I, that's why I, I feel so much for you and, and, and your generation and what you've gone through. Because I think that was the first time I literally said to myself that I felt old. And I was in my early 30s. I was not ancient. Um, but that was the first time I considered myself free of my childhood forever. And that's what we took from you. We failed you. Now we're going to do our best to fix it. And that's what this group is all about. Thanks, John. And thanks to all of you, um, especially those of you that that did 
take a moment to share your personal connection to this issue. Um, you didn't have to do that. And I know um, it's probably exhausting to have to continue to do that. Um, but I just want to say that your strength <clears throat> really is um, inspiring and it helps me come back to the work every single day. Um, so, so thank you for being here and for sharing your stories. Um, I do want to make sure that we get in some of these questions um, because we do have a couple of great questions from participants. Um, we'll start with a question from Christina Schlitt. She, Christina said, hi, is there any, is there action plan to oppose the new referendum or proposal by gun supporters to rescind ERPO laws? Curious now that common sense life-saving laws have been passed. I live in a rural community where there will be support, much to our alarm. Vicki, did you want to go ahead and get started? Yeah, I'll take that. Um, so it wasn't all that long ago that we had rural communities deciding to um, either at city commissioner meetings or county commissioner meetings say, declare themselves sanctuary counties. Um, and we may see, I, I've seen it around my area already where they've gone through that action. Now it's not legal. Dana Nessel seems to be quite prepared for um, that eventuality. Um, so, but I would also say this, being someone that actually brought together a group of people and showed up at county commissioner meetings and said all the reasons why this is a bad idea, you gotta do it. Because the more that um, county and city commissioners understand that voter, that their voters are not really supportive of this, um, they don't vote for it. And my county commissioners did not vote for it. And the counties around us did. So, um, we can expect that kind of action to go on in rural communities and all the more reason that we want to make sure that again, we have a big tent, we're talking amongst each other that we represent rural areas as well as urban areas to be able to share and have some best practices and lean on each other um, to actually have some good stories to tell and how we're going to combat that. And your other question was about gun supporters that are trying to rescind the ERPO law. We are watching the numbers. They are reporting on those numbers. It doesn't look like they're going to have enough numbers, at least at this point. So I think folks are more focused on implementation and education and making sure that people have the right story. I hope Thanks. that's Yep. Thanks, Vicki. Um, we, Bishop Perry, if you have something to add, um, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, I just, I just wanted to say that um, there's, um, we're not done, right? And so, and all, and and being there with the county commissioners, reaching out to all of our folks, that super matters. So that's that's we we can't rest. So go ahead, Sam. Thank you. We got some other questions. No problem. Thank you, Bishop Perry. Um, so let's see. Uh, the next question is from Michael Otto. Um, how important is it that we not only advocate for the end of gun violence, but advocate that people vote in November to assure that all our work is not put at risk next year? Go ahead, John. It's the most important thing you can do this year. There is no doubt, no question, no equivocation. If you do not elect leaders who will vote the way you need them to vote on this issue, you risk losing all the work we've done. There is nothing more important than electing pro-gun safety legislators to Lansing. Absolutely. I mean, to, to add on to that, when you're in the middle of a, a crisis, it certainly doesn't feel like things move very fast, but 
speaking from like a historical context, things moved very, very quickly in uh, the legislature over the, the course of this term. And my chief concern, frankly, seeing our opponents who have historically and continue to value guns over people's lives is that all of that can be undone just as quickly because now we have shown them how fast you can move when you're serious about it. And it's ridiculous to say that these people are serious about allowing people to continue to die and get hurt, but they are. Unfortunately, they have a voting record to show that. They have bills that they've introduced to already try and undo some of the work that we've done to show that. So like John said, it is one of the most important things. And I, I know it's like such a, a politician hackery thing to be like, oh, this is the most important election of our lives. I've been saying that every single time I've been running for office, but unfortunately it continues to be true. Guys, I really cannot like underline how unserious our opponents are and how little they care for the the gravity of the job and, and the role that they hold and what it means for people's day-to-day -day lives. Um, so it, it's, it's tremendously important. Um, and, and it, it does keep me up at night because like I said, like people's lives are going to be saved going forward, but all of that can be undone, unfortunately, um, if people don't, don't recognize that all of these things can be taken away. Thanks, Representative. Um, yeah, the work, to quote Bishop Perry, the work is not over. And part of that is getting out and voting. Um, we have another question from Stephen Haring. I apologize if I totally did not get that last name correct. But um, this is another question for Representative Pahutsky. As someone who represents a conservative community with some far right leaders, how do you educate your community before they become victims of misinformation? Mm. So, yeah, it is, it is important. Uh, one of the things that I really value is just an open line of communication. So I do my best to remain consistently available and talk about things as they're going through the process, right? So we talked about having committee hearings on, on this legislation. We, uh, send, we send out twice monthly uh, e-news emails with, you know, big important things that are coming up. I post uh, a breakdown of all of the votes that we took over the last two weeks and rationales for why I voted yes or no. And then we do coffee hours, we do town halls. So I find that the easiest way to confront that misinformation is truly just by confronting it head on, asking people to come out. Um, and, you know, I mean, sometimes that means that people that don't necessarily agree with what I did come out, but that's good. That's, it, it, it's not my job to make sure you agree with me, but it is my job to make sure that you understand the facts of, of what I voted on and why I did it and why it's important. Uh, we also do what's called legislative doors. You know, I know a lot of people are familiar with like campaign or issue-based door knocking. We also just knock on doors to give people updates on what we voted on. And I found that's a really, really invaluable tool. Uh, chances are your legislator does it too. And if this is an issue that you're you're passionate about, find out if they're doing it. I mean, they're certainly not doing it now because it's frigid, but um, you know, meeting people literally where they are on their doorstep, because you know, this is someone that you're not expecting to come to an event or to sign up for your e-newsletter. You're literally meeting them on their doorstep. And the number of times I've had people open a door who are really, really unhappy with something I did, and then we have a conversation about. That may not actually be an accurate, you know, description. Here's what actually this bill does. Here's why I voted yes. It's been so, so helpful. So confronting the mis misinformation, one means getting out ahead of it and, and trying to be as proactive as you can. Um, and then also not being afraid of calling BS what it is, which is just BS and, and not being afraid of, you know, gently correcting that misinformation when you find it out there in the wild. Thanks so much, Representative. Um, on a similar note, uh, we have a few questions and comments from Michael Burhans. Burhans. Um, and I do want to make sure that we, we mention these because Michael says, I'm very left on most issues, but I'm also a gun rights activist. However, I believe strongly we must come together on issues we can agree on and engage openly on the issues we disagree. I've been moved by this entire seminar. Is there a place for someone like me in the movement? I would like to say 
Absolutely, Michael. And um, you may have already seen the link that we put in the chat. Um, please fill out that, follow that link and fill out your information so that you can get involved. Um, there absolutely is a place for you in this movement. Um, and then Michael also asked, uh, are we willing, I'm trying to find your question, but based on memory, he was asking if we're willing to engage with um, someone who might be <clears throat> not totally aligned um, in this movement. And I want to open this up uh, to everyone, but first, John, yeah, I think you- Yeah, he's singing my song. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I've been a firearms instructor in the state for over 25 years. I came up to the self-defense community. Uh, I have been on the right, the left, and the middle. And I guess what I would say is I've chosen non-obscenity. Um, I am a super owner, if, if we're defining gun owners correctly. Uh, I used to teach uh, kids before they left for basic training or for the police academy. Um, I am not your traditional leftist on this call today. But what I will tell you is, is that we're not here talking about there's absolutely a place for you in this movement because we're talking about gun safety. And even more than gun safety, we're talking about public safety, right? It's 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 a public issue. Um, if you're if you're a gun owner, you certainly know that the minute the round leaves the the barrel, you're responsible for it, no matter what. If you have that level of responsibility in your heart, we'd love to talk to you. Call me anytime. And I would also like to add to that to say that there's, I think. I think it's actually the most important people to be a part of this movement are people who are gun rights activists because the people who oppose us, you know, most of the time are gun owners. Um, and I think it's important to say, like, you know, we want you to have your freedoms. We want you to have your guns. Um, this is nothing against you. It's everything against um, using uh, misusing weapons and uh, improperly using weapons. Um, and I, I, I grew up in Lansing, but I went to high school in Owasso, Michigan, which um, is a very conservative area. Um, but I think the most important conversation that I can have with someone is the common sense of our bills are here to save lives, not take your gun away. Um, and I think the education with understanding the laws and properly educating even our friends and family members is the most important advocacy we can do because they'll in turn you know educate their fans and family members so there's absolutely a space for you in this this is not a right left issue this is nonpartisan, and this is not whether i'm against or for guns this is all for safety all for saving lives so just to add one thing too um because we heard recently from the Episcopal Diocese in the UP, um, which probably arguably has one of the biggest gun cultures um, in Michigan, and also um, experiences one of the highest suicide rates. Um, they actually started giving gun safety locks out um, through churches and through their um, their outreach and and made it more about patient or not patient sorry i'm health is on the brain um made it more about gun safety and how do we keep our kids safe and so that centers the discussion and so even even in the up um where you would think maybe there could be much more of a divide there isn't quite the divide Thank you. Um, we have one last question uh, from Stephen. Um, what's everyone's opinion on gun-free zones? Detroit City Council has been lobbying for one in Greektown, and many left-leaning people have spoke against it. Anybody want to start us off here? I see a look of confusion from John. <laughs> I, I'll add to it. Um, I think that whenever 
there are changes, especially in communities that are underserved and they are worried that they would be impacted negatively. Um, in my opinion, at this rate, with children being the number one recipients of gun violence, I think that trying something, either it works or it doesn't work, trying something is going to help. I, I support that. Uh, I will say I understand. I, th I think a lot of the concern, and we dealt with this when we were dealing with all of the gun safety legislation. The unfortunate fact is the people who are going to be impacted most by the criminalization of anything are primarily black and brown populations. So I understand why there's a concern about creating a gun-free zone where there's a, a, a concentration not only in that place, but surrounding of black and brown Michiganders. Um, I, I think that context is important though. Gun-free zones writ large uh, are places where, you know, I mean, so I'm just going to, I'm going to use my workplace as a, a recent example, because for up until literally last year, you could bring a gun into the Michigan state Capitol. And we have seen what resulted from that, uh, you know, prior to January 6th, 2021, uh, April 20th, 2020, we had armed protesters try to break onto the house floor We've regularly had um, armed people intimidate legislators either in the, the balcony or in our offices. I had uh, one of the NRA lobby days. They tried to block me from leaving my office by flashing their gun and blocking the door. Um, there are places where it is not practical, safe, appropriate to have a gun. And I, I'm not going to comment just because I, I don't feel intelligently enough uh, like informed on it to comment about whether or not Greek town should be one of those places. Uh, but I will say that there are a lot of places that are or are in the process of becoming gun-free zones where you should not have a gun because emotions run high, um, intimidation is likely, and people can get killed. So I, I do not see an issue with gun-free zones writ large, but context is important and, and figuring out um, you know, who is going to be most impacted by that is an important conversation to have and I think leads to better policies. I think that we need to be open and honest about the ramifications of things while we're in, turn, in, in the process of determining those policies to try and weed out as many of them as we, we possibly can. Well, I'm gonna weigh in. Um, not on Greetown, but on gun-free zones. Um, if you flip over a concealed pistols license in the state of Michigan, you will see all the places you already can't take your gun, right? You can't be in a group of more than 250 people. You can't be in a place that serves alcohol. You can't use narcotics and carry a firearm. So they're already by law enforced gun-free zones, and there's a lot more of them than you think there are. Um, you know, if you go to Black Rock Steakhouse for dinner in Novi and you carry your gun inside, you've broken the law. They have a bar. So there are already a lot of places that are quote unquote gun-free zones. Um, and Lori made a great point. There are places where conflict is liable to happen, right? People get too many drinks in them. The last thing you really want is to have firearms exchanging bullets between drunk people in, in bars. It's just common sense. You can't carry your firearm into an auditorium, right? Or a, or, or a football game or a college campus, right? Because it's just common sense. There's a lot of emotional duress and the last thing you want with emotional duress is accessibility to deadly force. So there are already gun-free zones. And um, I can't say like if I'm for or against it in Greektown, but if you wanna promote tourism, you want people to feel safe going somewhere. And that may be a factor that people aren't talking about is that they'd like that to be a gun-free zone because then people will feel safe enough to go there. 
And this is not just about tourism. It's about the people that actually live in the city and having somewhere safe, feeling okay, because people walk around all throughout the city and nobody should have to worry about somebody having a gun and shooting. And again, I do understand the ramifications. It has been proven. So we have to trust that our legislators that are working on different law enforcement and laws have taken that into consideration. so much. What a well-rounded response from all of our panelists. It's part of why, um, just going back to something that was mentioned earlier, is the diversity of this coalition. Um, and we all come from so many different backgrounds and, and geographical regions. Um, and it really is what's so beautiful about this coalition and this work, because we're able to have um, responses from people who um, come from that area, who come from a background in, you know, police work, who are working in the government, right? So um, I, I just want to thank all of our panelists for being here. You're all amazing. Um, as part of the coalition myself, um, I I always love seeing you all and getting a chance to chat with you and and work with you. Um, and then thank you to all of our participants for being here um, and staying strong in the last session of the day, and we look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Have a great day. Thanks, guys. Thank you all. Were we supposed to hang out for the debriefing? Um, I think that we can go to the backstage and then... Did people leave, though? Let's see.